As he always does, Ben Constantine rises bright and early. He sees no reason to continue sleeping when he has had enough rest and is ready to begin another exciting day. He gets dressed quickly, for spending too much time on clothes was just a waste of time, and turns his attention to his grand shelf of action figures, each different from the rest, each with its own story. He picks out two that he hasn't used in a while, an elven ranger and a fanged vampire. Smiling, he leaves his room, already thinking out the tale of these two adversaries. In the warm morning light, he walks downstairs into the dining room where he sees <gasps> a collection of brand new figures. All for his taking. Whoa, fresh, new, little or off, but totally awesome. Mom, Dad, where did these come from? Actually, Benjamin, these were of my making. Ah, Mr. Vampire! Indeed, the shadowy form of our stranger, Janus, becomes evident, resting on a couch in the adjacent living room. I told you, I'm not a vampire. Would a vampire make you these figures? He would if it was a trick. It's a trick! I assure you, no trick. I was doing some work for your father late last night. When I was modeling out some things he needed, I noticed he has a 3D printer in the garage, along with some spare computer parts. I decided to make these for you to give you more stories to imagine. There are also some things for your sister and parents to thank them for their hospitality. So that's why you asked me about gifts yesterday. Are you sure this isn't some evil supervillain plot? That these don't have bombs in them? <laughs> I promise, Ben. There's nothing in there that can harm you in any way. Just some figures for your collection. This one I call Willia. With the sword and the whip and all the armor. She looks strong, doesn't she? I guess. I don't think she'd be any match for this ranger, though. He could just shoot her from 200 yards away, and she'd never know. That's what you get for melee weapons. A ranger, hmm? I used to know someone like this. All pride, all style, no humility at all. Perfectly happy to keep stepping on the downtrodden the week. Say, speaking of the week. Janus puts down Ben's figure and picks up a bearded, long-haired, armored warrior wielding a warhammer. Whoa, nice metallic colors. I like the beard, too. Thanks. This one is based off of an old legend from my town. We call him Sir Gimgornlas Legornly, God of Hammers, Perisher of Weak. Why do they call him that? because he was a knight, one of the greatest in the land. But unlike his fellow knights, Sir Gimgornlas never used a sword or a bow or any of those things. He used... A hammer? That's strange. All the knights I know used swords. Well, there's a thing. Every knight on the field with Sir Gimgornlas was a sword wielder. They were all the same, except Sir Gimgornlas himself. His hammer made him different. Unique. Unpredictable. One moment he'd be parrying with the shaft of his hammer. The next he'd be using it to crush his opponent's kneecaps. And all the knights were so used to fighting against swords, against the people like them, that they couldn't defend against his hammers. He had so many hammers, see? That's why he was a god of hammers. And why did they call him Perisher of the Weak? Because he perished all those he saw as weak. All those he thought were squandering their potential, but still had the arrogance to think they weren't. Suddenly, Janus picks up the Gimgornless figure and waves it towards Ben's ranger. You, ranger, how dare you be so prideful? Excessive pride makes you weak, and the weak must perish. Ben is quick to play along, clashing the figures together. No, you can't beat my arrow volley! Pew, pew, pew! Hey, no fair! That's what you get for being weak and facing Sir Gimgornlas Legornly, God of Hammers, because the weak must perish. <laughs> With that, the two pick up some more of the newly made figures and do battle all morning till the sun's light floods the room. 
More than an hour after Janus had retold the saga of Sir Gimgornless in action figure form, Kara arrived downstairs, looking over the two with surprise and confusion. Oh, Kara, good morning. Please, have a seat. Would you like anything for breakfast? No, no I'll get it myself. All right. Here, take this. Janus hands her a crystalline prism. Its many sides, each coated into different colors, and split into smaller, diamond-shaped parts. Tenuously, Kara twists some of the pieces around. So, it's a fancy Rubik's Cube. Well, not a cube, it's... Yeah, I get it. So Ben gets some nice figures, and I get this. Your brother suggested a puzzle. These were common in my home, among some of the masters. This was, unfortunately, as complex as I could get without exhausting your father's resources too much. <laughs> Do you like it? Thanks, but no thanks. I'll be fine without it. She places the prism on the table and walks away to get breakfast. Janus, confused, stares off at her blankly. Mr. Janus? Mr. Janus? Uh, my apologies, Ben, if you took my silence as insulting. That was just odd for me, that's all. What do you mean? Well, in my home, it is tradition to always accept a gift, no matter how undesirable it may be. To not accept a gift would be to shun the gifter, to reject their friendship. And because the gifter is a part of my society, a part of our family, that would be considered a terrible, unforgivable crime. That is why whenever you are given a gift in my home, you always accept it. Because to do otherwise would be to turn your back on all gifts you were given in life, like all the people in your world. Suddenly, Janus stands and heads for the front door. Where are you going? To fix something. Fix what? A mistake I made. A gift I rejected. Show your parents what I have created for you and your sister. I will return soon, with something for your mother, hopefully. With that, Janus heads at the door. Ben stares at the door for a moment before running off to get his parents. Mom! Dad! Come here! What is it, Ben? This had better be important. I've got a bunch of work to do tomorrow and- Look! Look! Janus made these figures! And this puzzle is for Kara! Aren't they nice? That's it? This is what you disturbed me for? Why, that's very nice, Ryan. Aren't you going to put them with the rest of your collection, Ben? I want to play with them first. Well, be careful not to break them, or to hurt yourself with them, and- Wait, stop. You said he made them? That Janus guy? He said he used the 3D printer in the garage, Dad. My 3D printer? Without my permission? I like them, Dad. Look, Ryan, I think he just wanted to do something nice for the kids. Jenna seems like a nice man. I doubt it. I see what he's doing. He's giving us these things, so we owe him something. So we have to keep him here, away from the authorities he's running from. I'm not falling for it. Get rid of them, Ben. I want him gone as soon as possible, so he can stop disturbing me. Where, where is he anyways? Oh, uh, he left, Dad, but- Really? When? Just before I brought you downstairs. Hooray! In a moment of unbridled joy, Mr. Constantine picks up his son and shakes him about. <laughs> much to Ben's surprise. That little devil's gone away. Now I can finally work in peace. You know, that rascal interrupted me in the middle of my very important work last night. Right, Claire? I'm sure he didn't mean anything by it. He only wanted to help. Ha! As likely as a lion helping a mouse. Come on, look at this. Beckoning furiously, Mr. Constantine leads the rest of his family upstairs. They arrive in Mr. Constantine's room, which seems to be brand new. The window frame is repaired and fastened securely to the wall, while the mess of clothes that had lay around Mr. Constantine's room is now folded into fresh, neat stacks. The desk seems revitalized with a new, brilliant white color and sturdy construction. Even the walls seem like, and smell like, they were freshly painted with the subtle but vibrant blue now coating the once gray walls. Wow, it, it's like a miracle. What happened here? 
I guess Janus Claus got you a new room for your present, Dad. What did you say? Janus Claus? Well, yeah. He's like Santa Claus, but his name is Janus. So that's his name, I guess. You think this is funny? You think this is a joke? Who knows where all these materials came from? Wood doesn't just appear out of nowhere. Paint doesn't just pop into existence. He's taken our things, and for what? I can't concentrate with all of this around me. He's disrupting my work. Hasn't that man ever heard of personal organization? Just because my organization methods don't make sense to him doesn't mean they don't make sense to me. Dear, your organization skills never were the neatest in the first place. Or the prettiest. Or the most existent. Now look, I've got to comb through all of this, fix all these bugs by tomorrow afternoon. I don't want anyone disturbing me for anything. Until then, got that, Ben? Ben, now wanting to tell his father that Janus will be back, simply nods. Good. Now leave me be. Go! Get out! What about breakfast, Ryan? You've already been up for a few hours. Aren't you going to eat something? No time. Are, are you sure? All right, we'll go. Come on, then. You see, your father needs to work. He's under a lot of pressure right now. Dejectedly, Mrs. Constantine ushers Ben out of the room and back down the stairs. Rubbing his head, Mr. Constantine turns back to his work. Ah, <sighs> that menace. It's good that he's gone. Now if my family just stays out of my way, if they just leave me alone, I might actually finish this on time. I have no other choice. While her father demanded some peace and her mother and brother hurried down the stairs, Kara Constantine sat in her room, reading some book on world history. It was a long, thick tome filled with all sorts of quotes and anecdotes, and usually Kara would find something like this gnawing away at her time till she was finished. Yet today, even more so than the intricacies of the world wars, the events just outside her door fascinated her. What exactly is so important about Dad's work that he can't find a moment to talk to us? I can try to help, but it's not gonna work. And so Dad will stay cooped up in his room working. Ben will go back to playing with his figures and Mom will keep looking over our shoulders, worrying about us constantly. We're all under the same roof, but we may as well be in different countries. This isn't how a family is supposed to work. Hmm. And that stranger Janus, too. I heard him leave earlier. It's good that he's gone. Now I can figure out how to get everyone back together without having to account for another person. There surely has to be some way that we can be a family like we used to be, together, all the time, always, always there for one another instead of all split. It's like a puzzle, isn't it? I've got to get all these pieces into the right place, but Dad won't listen, Ben will probably refuse to get his head out of his figures. There's nothing I can do but wait. She looks over at the strange, multicolored, multi-faced prism that Janus had given her. A couple of the diamond-shaped faces are lined up so that their colors matched, but more often than not, they are still jumbled about. Now here's a puzzle that I don't have to wait to solve. Again, it's basically just a Rubik's Cube, and I've solved plenty of those, but it may still be a challenge. Hmm. Maybe when I'm done with this, Dad will have the time to listen, to be with us again, so that we can all be together. But the more that Kara shifted and swapped the pieces of the prism around, the more she saw something underneath. It was a glimpse at first, some amethyst crystal at the very center that she thought nothing of. Perhaps it was just whatever allowed all these pieces to move after all. She could not, however, ignore it after almost half an hour of fiddling with the prism. If it really was the centerpiece, why would it be colored like that? Why not just whatever is convenient? White or black or whatever color Dad had lying around? Janus went out of his way to make the middle this color. There must be some meaning behind it. If I can't solve the puzzle of my family, 
I, I've got to solve at least this one. Janus walks down the street, much less disheveled than just the day before. His long, string-like hair flows in the gentle morning wind as he focuses on a map on his phone. Every now and then, he looks up and around, trying to pinpoint where he is, before continuing on his way. Occasionally, Janus has to stop and recalibrate his position entirely, but these are merely minor inconveniences on a short trek. Finally, he finds himself just where he wants to be, an open field, part of a park and apparently deserted. Taking a last glance at his phone, Janus trudges over the yellow, dry grass, scanning the keeled over trees and the worn green benches for any bystanders. Certain that there was no one around, Janus makes his way to the very center of the field, kneeling down in the crumbling grass. He produces a small bottle of oil and spreads it around him in almost a perfect circle, then places his hands on the ground. Suddenly, the oil ignites, surrounding him with blue and purple flames. It has been too long, far, far too long, since I have had the means to visit this place. It will be nice to see a familiar face or two again. The flames work their way towards him, and Janus closes his eyes. He allows the fire to shake and shape the world around him, until he finds himself no longer kneeling in a decrepit park. Now he is alone, in his mind, with his own thoughts. And those thoughts speak. A great shadow falls over him, and he whips around to see a giant figure emerging from the infinite void that he stands upon. Higher and higher, the figure rises, until finally, Janus stands at the figure's foot, as small as an ant. The figure crosses his arms and cries, How dare you, Jeroen Riesel! Abandon your family and home like so! How dare you forsake what has been given to you so generously? I have not abandoned my home. My home has abandoned me. You lie! You ran not because you had to. You ran not because you were forced to. You ran because you are a coward, a fool. You left because you are scared of the consequences if you remain. No, I wish not to be a citizen of El Regidium. I wish not to be who they want me to be. I wish only to be me. But is such a desire not selfish, young Jeru? Is it not, by definition, putting yourself above others? The way of your home is to follow your desires and passions, but more so, in doing so, to serve your home as part of a greater whole. Is that not what you teach? Is that not what you are obligated to? What kind of man forsakes his obligations like so? A wise one, when those obligations are stupid. False, misguided souls are they who follow such paths without thought of their own. Is that not what you taught me, Master? Is that not what you sought all your students to understand? Is that not the creed you wanted us to live our lives by? I know it is you, Master. A moment passes as the figure looks down upon him, and in that moment, Janus's blood runs cold, knowing the behemoth could stamp him out instantly. But then the giant figure shrinks in size, until he and Janus stand eye to eye. Wisely spoken, apprentice. It has been a long time since you have come here. Indeed, master. You know why I'm here, I'm sure. You are here because you made a mistake, an error you intended to correct. Wise as always, Master. Walk with me, Jeru. The Master beckons to Janus with a troubled expression, and begins to step slowly in no particular direction. Frozen for a second, Janus follows his old Master. How have you been, Master? Have you been well? I thought I taught you better than this, Jeru. You know this space brings no comfort for those like me. I must say, you must be truly desperate to find yourself here again. You know there are many who wish great vengeance upon you for what you have done. You included, Master? Or do you understand now? <laughs> I know not why you did what you did. I am still of the opinion that there were better solutions to the situation. 
But I do know that harming you would serve no end save cruel, petty revenge. And pettiness is not worth the taking of another life. Yes, Master, I remember your teachings well. Do you? I thought you were smarter and kinder than a killer, Jeru. I thought you were one who would carefully consider all courses of action. And I thought you were friend. I could not hesitate, Master, and I am still sorry. Time has done nothing to my guilt. Remember what I told you long ago, Jeru? One must always take careful thought. Take time to logically apply yourself. Your thoughts are no good if they are with flaws. It is better to not act than to act with a flawed mindset, after all. I'm ashamed you would have forgotten such a basic tenet of my teachings. I apologize, Master. But if I had not acted... No. I know what I did was right. Even if I have... Regret for the consequences of my actions. I do not regret the ultimate outcome. Nowhere is a device safer than with me. Perhaps it is. But... I feel all this could have been avoided in Jeru. I should have turned you from the path you were going down. I could have stopped all this. But I did not. It is my fault, then. A teacher should always be held responsible for the errors of his students. Master, you blame yourself too much. I take full responsibility. It's my duty, after all, to accept that. The error is mine. I just wasn't a good fit for our world. How so? Back home, I was always part of a greater whole. A whole that I did not always agree with. A whole that I did not always like. It is... Freeing to be able to separate myself from that. To have value outside of what I am told to do and what I am told to value. To have value for myself. This new world I am seeing, Master. There are greater problems here than at home. I can do something about that. Is that wrong? No, Jeru. It is not wrong. But I feel in doing this, you may lose your tradition, your heritage, will you not? Master, tradition is nothing more than long-held opinions and ways and views. And like all opinions, some are right, some are wrong. I will not abandon home, trust me, Master. I shall keep it in my soul and thoughts always, but I will not err just because my ancestors made the same mistakes. If that is your thought, Jeru, then so be it. Now, I suppose you wish to do what you truly came here for. Yes, Master. Very well. You know how to find her. Janus closes his eyes, focusing on an image of one Marie Lor Ila, an old friend. He recalls her angular face and focus expression in the long, neat brown hair, with the points of her ears just sticking out. And in the horizon, this image of Mari begins to take focus, blurred and distorted at first, but sharpening over time, before finally she appears perfectly clear in front of him, as if they were no worlds apart. She's a bit different than James remembers. Her charcoal black uniform now has accents of green and purple woven throughout, a step up from the last time Jaina saw her. Silver gauntlets instead of bronze now shield her forearms, and her necklace has a couple more totems that he doesn't recognize. She's a leading member of the Krakura, the very organization that seeks to capture Janus. And yet, the two of them simply look at each other, and smile. Hello, Jaru. It has been... a while. 